I am uh, so happy to be here, and uh, thanks, Dean Gillum, for uh, bringing me. I'm uh, uh, honored to be here at this great institution and, uh, and to speak to this obviously great audience, uh, very serious students, I can tell. And uh, it's, uh, it's a, uh, a very gratifying experience for me to be here. So thank you all for coming. I uh, am, am going to uh, try and contain myself and, and, and not, uh, not talk past the uh, time that we need to have plenty of discussion. <coughs> These are the main topics that I, I want to uh, cover before we have the discussion. But you uh, need you to speak a little louder. Pretend you're me. Okay. I'll hold it a little closer. <coughs> the uh, laser is not working. <coughs> Is this? Yeah. Okay, it's just not as bright as I expected. Okay, those are those are the main topics. I'm going to share new information with you on trends with respect to the prevalence and seriousness of gang problems across the United States. Uh, we have gathered this information at the National uh, uh, Gang Center, it's now called. We dropped youth from it, expanded our scope a bit uh, a year or so ago. Uh, but uh, this is a uh, new information that covers a 14-year period from 1996 to 2009 in our National Youth Gang Survey. And then before we start talking about prevention, which I want to spend a lot of time on today, I want to, I want to talk about starter gangs or how, how kids get started in gangs or how gangs get started. And, and think about that from the, from the standpoint of how we can prevent prevent kids from being involved and perhaps prevent gangs from forming. That's difficult. But that process will entail thinking about windows of opportunity and how we can intervene in risk factors and, and with uh, protective factors. And I'd like to spend a little time talking about the uh, fascinating uh, HUD, uh, federal HUD uh, program, the Moving to Opportunity uh, Experiment. How many of you are familiar with that? Okay, quite a few. Good. It's fascinating and, and provides some interesting implications for prevention and intervention. So those are the main topics, and, and if, if we can hold discussion until we get to the end, then I assure you we'll have plenty of time, and that way uh, uh, maybe uh, I will cover some of the issues that you might, you might want to raise. I certainly hope so. Uh, let me just tell you briefly about this National Youth Gang Survey that we started in in 1996, uh, as recommended by one of the great gang researchers who first got me involved, Dr. Walter Miller. And he recommended the creation of a federal center for tracking gang activity across the United States. So we took his recommendation seriously at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention and established the National Youth Gang Center and the National Youth Gang Survey. We sur survey a nationally representative sample of law enforcement agencies and have every year. There are two samples. I'll skip the first one. We resampled in 2002. And the important thing to know here is that there are four <coughs> subsamples in this national sample. All police departments serving populations of uh, greater than 50,000, all suburban county police and sheriff's departments and then randomly selected samples of law enforcement agencies in, in areas between 2,500 and 50,000 population, and a randomly selected sample of uh, rural county law enforcement. So together, we have a nationally representative sample. Now, first I want to show you what we call prevalence, presence of gang activity. Here's, here's what we've seen over the 14-year period from 1996 to 2009, and we saw a drop in, in uh, prevalence or uh, <coughs> answers to the question, did you experience gang activity in the past year? In 1996, almost 40% said that they did, and that dropped to 24% in 2001 and has increased about, pardon me, about 24% since then, back up to uh, just over one-third. Uh, but this doesn't tell us much about the seriousness of uh, gangs. This is just areas that report presence of gangs or gang activity. So in the past uh, few months, we've been uh, conducting some interesting analyses, I think, uh, 
that uh, shed some, uh, provide some insights into the seriousness of gang activity. The first observation that comes to mind when you look at, at this uh, trend line is that the gang problem became less serious here and then increased in seriousness. Well, that's not necessarily the case. We need to look behind these data to uh, look at where gang problems are reported and where they're the most serious. We're going to, uh, I'm going to show you results of trajectory analyses that we've done. Now, this is a new technique in criminology that uh, was first used to map individual offender careers. I'm just showing you this as an example. This is not the data from our survey. This is data from the Rochester Youth Development Study following juvenile uh, delinquents uh, over a period of, uh, from age 13 to 23. But these are rates, these are six-month rates of offending. So if you're looking at the entire juvenile offender career. Here is the uh, high-level chronic offenders that increase uh, significantly in uh, their offending rate up to about age 14 or 15 and, and, then, and then dropped off. Uh, the next group is slow intake so uptake chronic offenders in this uh, dark uh, dotted line. So you can see the changes in offender careers over time, increasing and de decreasing. They're, they're not just two groups, the early on onset and the late onset, as Moffitt uh, suggested. There are several patterns. Well, this inspired us to see if we could map the histories of cities, gang activity. So we're, we want to see if if uh, once a city has a gang problem, if they have one forever after that. That's one of the major claims about gangs. Once they move in, you got them for good. Once a kid joins a gang, you are hooked for life. Well, that's not what the research shows. But I just wanted to show you this illustration of an individual's trajectories. And now we're going to look at cities' trajectories in the National uh, Youth Gang Survey data. Here we, we look at all of those in that trend line I showed you over the 14-year period. So we're looking at presence of gang activity in the survey. A one a value of one is yes, zero is no. So what this shows is that 69.9% of all of our respondents said virtually every year over that 14-year period that they had gang activity. So in two-thirds of the localities, it's a somewhat permanent condition. Gang presence year after year after year, with just a few exceptions there. So, so uh, for two-thirds, that is the common problem. Now, here is, uh, here is the, uh, the next group. Here is a group of 55 uh, jurisdictions, 9%, that started out reporting gang activity in the late 1990s, and then the activity uh, diminished to practically zero in 2000, and then increased sharply after that. So the problem uh, got better, and then it got worse again. So that's a separate group. This trajectory analysis groups cities in terms of their common pattern, you see. Cities or counties, uh, whatever you're uh, sampling, you're sampling all here. So that's a second common pattern. Here is a, uh, here's a third and uh, fourth one. Here's 29 cities, 5%, that started out not having gang activity in 1996, and then increasing consistency of gang activity up to the point where every year they have reported a problem since about 2004. Now here's another group that started out not having gang activity, but still uh, somewhat inconsistent. That's 25 uh, cities, counties, and rural areas. Uh, now here's two more groups. Here's a, here's a group right here, this dark green line that started out reporting gang activity. So this is a desistance group. Uh, they had uh, gang activity pretty consistently for quite a while, but then it just kept dropping off, dropping off. That's 39 localities. And down at the bottom here, here's another 32 that have, have never had uh, gang activity to speak of. So we see them different histories of cities and counties and rural areas. 
here we're looking at every respondent in our survey that uh, reported gang activity at any point. That's 598 out of our total sample of nearly 2,000. Now, now we want to look at, pull out those that have really serious gang problems, and homicide is the best indicator. So in this trajectory analysis, we're looking only at cities with populations of 100,000 or more because the research shows uh, that uh, the larger cities tend to have a more serious and persistent gang, gang problem. So looking at the percent of homicides that are gang related, we use uh, the uh, FBI's Uniform Crime Report database for this, looking at reported homicides of any type and then from our National Youth Gang Survey responses in these localities, looking at the percent then, uh, calculating the percent of uh, uh, total <coughs> homicides that are gang related in those large, very large cities of 100,000 population or more. So it's percent of homicides that are gang related. Now here we see five uh, main uh, trajectory types. Uh, here at the bottom, uh, these uh, 55 cities, or 22%, never had a high percentage of uh, homicides that are gang related. Now, here in this second group, 105 of these uh, large cities, 42.5%, had about 20% of their homicides uh, being gang related. Now, here's the third group that showed an increase, an increase from zero up to about 60%. That's 14 uh, of these very large cities. That's worth paying attention to. Now, here's two really wild cards. Over 60% of their total homicides were gang-related starting out in 1996, and that increased to over 80% in 2009. Those two jurisdictions happen to be in California, Inglewood and Salinas. Now, you say, well, what about Los Angeles? A uh, very high number of homicides. Yes, but the rate, we're looking here at the rate or percent of the total that's gang related. So because there's a huge number of homicides in Los Angeles, then the rate uh, uh, doesn't uh, pull it up to the top. But rather in uh, Salinas and Inglewood, uh, their, their, uh, their rate uh, does, uh, does pull those up. So we see different we see different histories here in these uh, in these five clusters. But the thing that's most important in this is that among these cities with a hundred thousand population, none showed a decreasing pattern in their histories of gang homicides. Not a single group. Every one of these groups shows a stable uh, gang homicide uh, phenomenon or increasing. So there's a message for us. If you're looking at the largest cities, uh, over 100,000 population, then you see that not much has changed in the uh, incidence of uh, gang homicide. So that, uh, that got our attention. And uh, this map shows where those uh, different trajectories are located. Uh, George Tita, a uh, great uh, criminologist at UC Irvine, and uh, Beth Griffiths, did this trajectory analysis and mapping for us, and George did the mapping. This is incredible. So for the first time, we see where these uh, different groups of uh, cities with uh, homicide problems are located across the country. So there, there are five uh, main, uh, main clusters out uh, here. Uh, now here, you see they're, they're all, all five of those trajectory groups are shown here. It's represented by different colors from uh, less serious to uh, more serious. And the Bay Area, San Francisco, and around that area, the Los Angeles uh, region, <coughs> the Great, Great Lakes. This is a, this is a new uh, development, uh, relatively, uh, over the past uh, few years. Uh, the uh, Northeast, uh, that Northeast corridor, and uh, then uh, Florida, Florida coast. So those are the only uh, uh, really pronounced clusters that you see. But uh, the general pattern is a distribution of serious gang problems as measured by homicides across the country. Uh, a colleague and I recently 
wrote a history of uh, the development or emergence of gangs in the United States, starting with New York City at the end of the Revolutionary War. And then, and then uh, Chicago uh, uh, developed gang problems about 50 years later, and then uh, the uh, Los Angeles area another 50 or so years after that. So, so we've had this notion that, of course, uh, Chicago and L.A. are considered the gang capitals of the United States because approximately half of the gang uh, of all homicides in those two cities are gang related. But uh, what we see here is that we better pay attention to a lot of other localities around the country, that the problem is not confined to L.A. and Chicago by any means. In fact, what our national youth gang survey data show is that, that on average about a quarter of all homicides in cities across the United States are gang related. So there are a lot of jurisdictions with serious gang problems uh, as measured by homicide that aren't getting a lot better based on that analysis. So we're having a lot of fun with that. Uh, as you can see, this is really, really exciting stuff. The, the next step that we want to take is to drill down into those trajectory types and see what factors, if we can find some factors that might account for changes in those trajectories, getting worse, getting better. Uh, what is it that uh, changes the uh, severity of the uh, homicide problem? Now, if you look more closely at, at uh, available data, you, you, you start to question the general assumption that that the gang problem is not as serious as it used to be. That's a general conclusion that the media and some others have drawn in thinking about the, the drop in overall violence as reflected in the FBI's Uniform Crime Reports. So the assumption is that the gang problem has diminished as well. Uh, not so. Uh, let's look at Chicago and L.A. Some interesting data here. The, this, is, this is the rate of murders per uh, 100,000, uh, uh, the rate of uh, gang homicides per 100,000 murders in Chicago from 1991 to 2004. <coughs> the top line is all Chicago murders. So there's your drop. There's your big conclusion. Homicide is not as big a problem in Chicago as it used to be. Correct. But the next line is non-gang motivated murders. Pretty sharp drop there, from up near 30% down to 10%. But let's look at gang-motivated murders. 5%, it got up to 15, back to 5. So it's back to the level it was in 1991. So you haven't seen the huge drop. So at this point, a larger proportion of total homicides in Chicago are gang-related than in the past because of the drop of non-gang homicides. So, uh, it hasn't changed much. Let's look at some California data. Uh, oh, one other uh, slide here on uh, Chicago. This is data uh, from the Chicago police on the percent of murder victims of street gang al altercations versus other events. The blue line is total street gang altercations. It includes homicides, aggravated assault, robberies, and so on. Well, look. That has uh, not changed much, and a slight increase here recently. Uh, so there's a very high level of street gang altercations that's not dropping, even though there's been a drop overall in homicide and uh, in uh, certain uh, forms of it. So you have to be careful in drawing generalizations with it, you know, if you don't look behind the data. Same thing with California. This is uh, George Tita and uh, his colleague uh, Abrams. Uh, analysis of uh, homicides made, uh, statewide in California in 2004-2010. This is a slide from the 2010 data. This is Hispanic males ages uh, 10 to 24. All right, so this is 1991 to 2008. And uh, the line it separates uh, LA, this is Los Angeles County, the entire county, and below is the rest of California. So it gives you a feel for the proportion of all homicides, uh, uh, the trend in uh, all uh, gang homicides uh, among the Hispanic males ages 10 to 24. So there has been 
uh, uh, a noticeable drop in Los Angeles County, but look statewide in the rest of California, an increase here in 2003, and not much of a decrease here, in fact a slight increase over the past few years. So uh, this is the group that has the highest rate of uh, gang homicides uh, across the state. So the problem is not getting better uh, when you look at this really, uh, really high rate group. So you have to be careful in drawing conclusions on a small amount of data. You, the more you drill down into the gang homicide data, you see a different pattern that the problem is not uh, getting better. It's still very, very serious. So where do we start? We need, to, we need to start at the beginning. We've made the mistake over so many years of putting so much emphasis on suppression under the assumption that, that, that the gang problem came from somewhere else and, and if you just meet them at the county line or the state line, you can drive them back and uh, everything will be uh, lovely. Not so. Almost without exception, gang problems are homegrown. Uh, and the migration that occurs is largely members' migration, or, or generally migration of the gang culture. Uh, that is the predominant factor, I think, that explains uh, increases in the outlying areas, uh, and perhaps uh, in the emergence of gang problems in Europe and some other places, the diffusion of the gang culture. Uh, but there is some regional migration of gangs themselves uh, out of Los Angeles, up, up the coast to uh, Seattle is uh, one pattern. But generally, according to Klein and Maxim's study, uh, not more than about a thousand miles. For the most part, it's uh, individuals who move in with their families who are getting involved that uh, account for that pattern. So we need to look within our own communities. And, and we need to, we need to uh, start with, at a very young age because the research, the longitudinal studies are showing more and more clearly that, that gang involvement begins back at a very young age in terms of the risk factors that predispose kids to join a gang. And, and I've been thinking a lot about, about this business of how gangs start. We don't have much research on how gangs start, and we don't have any studies that have successfully prevented gang formation, but it's an area that, that we really need to focus on. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this today. I'll, I'll leave this with you. You can uh, get a copy of the handout and take this home and impress your friends and loved ones. How gangs start, but there, there's, there's a, a little bit of research now that, that gives us some clues. If you put together the research on development of early childhood problems with uh, research on uh, formation of gangs in, in schools, then you start to, it starts to make some sense, or at least it does to me, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Uh, but it seems like that uh, these uh, gangs begin forming uh, uh, in uh, small groups of kids who are re uh, rejected, alienated, and aggressive about ages 10 to 13, they tend to uh, go to or uh, tend to form, or more likely to form in uh, what are called, the, this French study called difficult schools. By that they mean high rates of suspension, expulsion, dropout, really uh, strong zero tolerance policies, uh, low bonding of the kids uh, to the school, and uh, uh, problems at home, so they tend to be alienated at home and at school as well. So those, those kids tend to group together, and, and, and when they do, uh, then they begin to identify with, with each other, and they may give themselves a name, and then they may pick up elements of the gang culture to, to set themselves apart from others that are rejected and alienated them. Distinctive clothing, colors, rituals, start gathering regularly, excluding other kids, then they spend more time together, and involvement in the illegal activity might be the next step. And conflict with school officials and other authorities might give them cohesion. So this is a hypothetical process, you know, just trying to piece the research together as to how these gangs might form. So the school setting looks like a very important one for us to pay attention to. That French study found, found that this small group of kids that were highly rebellious of authority that were suspended, expelled, punished harshly, 
that tended to group together, that in these schools where those conditions were more prevalent, they'd be more difficult schools, they call them, about twice the percentage of kids were gang members. So uh, there's pretty clear evidence there. We don't have studies of that sort uh, that specific in the United States yet, but we will. Uh, now, then, then, then what happens? How, how does a kid join a gang? Here I'm drawing upon a great uh, UCLA researcher, Diego V. Hill. I wish he uh, were here today, but he has uh, jury duty. Uh, but one of the, uh, this may be the best single publication, in, in, my, in my view, in the entire field of gang research. Uh, a, a chapter he wrote in 1993 about the established gang. What that involves, how, how a gang becomes established, and how members are drawn into it. And I, I, I drug uh, out of this these, uh, these seven steps. I'm oversimplifying his work. I apologize for that. I apologize. Uh, but but uh, it, it, it uh, seems to make sense if you think about it from this standpoint. Kids in the community where there are established gangs, uh, they hear about the gangs in elementary school. And then when they get to junior high, they see them. And it validates their existence. Oh, they're real. They're real. And then they start to see that the schoolyard is divided up by different groups. And that no one messes with the gang members. They're the baddest of all. And so the kid who's alienated or rejected uh, may uh, gravitate toward that group. Uh, they feel uh, unsafe at school, uh, in the schoolyard, uh, where adult supervision is not present. And so they feel like uh, that they are uh, going to be victimized if they uh, don't get some protection. So they uh, may gravitate toward the, uh, the gang because they feel like if they're isolated, that's to invite uh, disaster. Uh, so they may have a casual association with the gang uh, on the schoolyard. If someone's bullying them, they may, they may move over there uh, in the corner uh, where the gang is present. So then you start getting some association uh, taking place. And, and then they may have a chance bonding on the street on the way home. He gives that as an example. Maybe the, maybe the gang's going to do a little shoplifting. The kid's been hanging out a little bit, so they invite him along. And then he has a, a bit of a bonding process that's starting to take place. So it's not, a, it's not an immediate process. The research shows that on average, it takes about two years, the process of joining a gang for most kids. Uh, they join a gang the same way you or I join an organization. Find out about it, you go to meetings, you, you know, uh, uh, to get, get a feel for it, you talk to people about it, and uh, uh, you don't join immediately, uh, you find out about it before you do. So it, it, it seems that, that these, uh, these steps uh, uh, make a lot of sense, but uh, go, go read the article and uh, you'll be happy you did. And I, and I dare you to find one sentence in that word, in that entire chapter that isn't clear. It's just a phenomenal piece of work. So we can learn from that. Now, here is a, uh, a schematic I developed to, to illustrate the windows of opportunity in thinking about this process. Intervention very early in these starter gangs or, or preventing uh, kids from joining gangs. Here's what the research shows. I, I, I didn't make this up, but when you look at the longitudinal studies, and there are lots of them now, uh, very young kids, uh, from uh, especially the first grade on up, what you see is that kids be begin to uh, develop problems first in the family. It's a developmental process. Kids are born into a family, so if they get on the wrong, off on the wrong foot in life with a, a bad family life, poor supervision, uh, drug uh, problems, or whatever, on the part of the parents, then those kids are, are apt to evidence conduct problems by age three or four. And those kids are apt to have more difficulty in elementary school. In the Seattle study that we did, elementary school failure was the strongest predictor of gang joining. <coughs> but the, the risk is increased along the line here. Those who failed elementary school are at greater risk of child delinquency. And about a third of those who are child delinquents in some uh, areas uh, join a gang. But this accumulation of risk factors increases the probability of joining a gang. It doesn't predict who's going to join, uh, but simply increases the likelihood. And it, what separates the gang members, those who join, from those who are simply involved in delinquency and violence, 
is a high level of risk factor. Uh, threshold level in one recent study of 11, up to 11 risk factors, kids were as likely to be violent as they were a gang member. But uh, beyond 11, they're more likely to be gang members. So the kids who join have more baggage. They have more problems. And they have more problems in these multiple areas. The research clearly shows that those who have problems in all five developmental domains that are much higher risk of joining a gang. Uh, so it's the accumulation. So we're going to have to address these risk factors starting at a very young age and prevent the accumulation of them. So I'll talk in just a bit about that continuum of prevention, intervention, and suppression. But it's going to take a continuum uh, of uh, programs because it's of the severity of these problems. A single program isn't going to change a kid's life uh, in a community where there's uh, lots of criminal activity, where uh, uh, schools are very poorly functioning, where families are uh, disorganized, alienating. A single program won't do it. It takes a collective effort. Now, I want to use as an example here this incredible experiment, the moving to opportunity experiment. Uh, and, and, and I'll show you the profundity of it here in just a moment. U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development had this idea, okay, we see very clearly that the families who live in very poor areas in public housing, high-rise public housing especially, uh, uh, evidence a lot of problems, mental health problems, drug abuse problems, delinquency, and so on. Lots of serious problems. Here. Let's just move them out. Let's move them out. Uh, any of you watch, used to watch the Jefferson show? <laughs> moving up. Moving uptown. Okay? So they subsidize uh, these uh, families who are living in these high poverty areas to give them a chance to move out. And, and, and so this uh, program was operated in five cities, and L.A. was one, one of them, along with New York and Chicago and Baltimore and Boston. And, and, and uh, so uh, about half the families, almost, were able to use the subsidies to rent up, to rent up into uh, areas that had a much lower rate of poverty. So you just move the entire family out. That should solve the problem, right? No, not completely. Here's what happened. The women and girls in the experimental families experienced a lot more safety. The biggest problem with the girls was that they were harassed by dirty old men and boys sexually, trying to get them involved in sexual activity at a very, very young age. But uh, once they moved away, uh, there was a great sense of relief. And, and, uh, and, 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 and these girls were less likely to use marijuana, less likely to be arrested than the control group girls, just as you would expect, just by moving those families completely out into a new environment where they could manage it, manage their risk, reduce their risk, get away from those dirty old men. And I'm oversimplifying just a little, but that was a very serious part of the problem. They reported less harassment from men and boys. And as a result, they were less fearful. Fear was reduced. And that changes a lot when you reduce fear. But the relocated boys seemed not to have benefited at all. The scoundrels didn't change. <laughs> they didn't change. And their behavior worsened in some respects. More behavior problems. More likely to smoke. More likely to be arrested for property crime. And most surprising, no less likely to be arrested for violent crimes than the control groups. Why did the girls change and the boys didn't? Go ahead, tell me. <laughs> it's fascinating. Maybe the boys didn't Yeah, that's a possibility. But they did. Yeah, okay, okay. They weren't comfortable. Yes. Yes, that could be it, right? That could be a good factor. Ah, the gang gave protection. Makes they connected to their old friends. Exactly. They couldn't break those ties. It felt too good. <coughs> Ripping and running. Ripping and running was just too comfortable, too rewarding. Being a big shot, carrying a gun. Uh, yes, sir. And they had a new territory. Ah, oh, they had a new territory. New opportunities for criminal activity. Good <coughs> boy. Well. But how, aren't some of these kids going to be on the verge? 
So that 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 makes sense for people who are already involved. But yeah. That doesn't seem to explain what would happen to kids who are not yet. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, they're looking at uh, it's a five to seven year follow up. So uh, most, uh, I think the sample was drawn such that they were about 12 years of age. Yeah, yeah, so it's you know, looking through the adolescent period. Well, it, it, th th this uh, study makes a profound, uh, raises a profound issue. And that is, we can't move everyone out in these horrible areas. It costs a lot of money to do that. So how can we create the conditions that protected the girls synthetically? How can we use programs to provide that protection, uh, to protect them from the dirty old man, and, and to uh, get them involved in pro-social activities? We're going to come back to that. Uh, but uh, first, I uh, want to, uh, oh, we've already discussed these, maintaining the ties and so on. But first, I want to uh, get you thinking about how to build a continuum of prevention, intervention, and suppression strategies. Prevention to reduce gang joining, intervention teams to get kids out, out of the gang, suppression to target the uh, most violent gang members, and to protect the uh, public. So what the research is showing is that this combination uh, sort of approach, this balanced approach, produces the best results. Uh, uh, but I, uh, I, I, before I talk about programs, I want to make a, a point that I think is important. And that is that we've been too narrow-minded in the human services field. We're, we're just so possessed with replicating exemplary and model programs. That's a good thing to do. But the assumption that has gone along with it, those promoting the replications, have not pointed out that that, will, that super duper program will only affect a small proportion of your clients. You need to have an impact across your entire system. And with gangs, in particular, these very high-rate offenders, what happens when a kid joins a gang is they're usually involved in delinquency, and when they're in the gang, their level of delinquency and violence increases sharply, and it drops off when they leave the gang, but usually not down to the lower level. So these are very high-rate offenders, so a single program is not going to solve the problem in most cases. And we also need to put more structure around them and their families because they're uh, disorganized themselves, and the schools are often disorganized, the community's disorganized, everybody's disorganized in a lot of these situations. So it's going to take uh, uh, a lot more structure. So I want to think first about some programs that, that uh, target these uh, risk factors with protection. Here's the great gang resistance education and training for students and families. So that targets individual and family factors. School suspensions, reduce those. Keep kids tethered to the school and to adult supervision. That's really important. So if you reduce suspension and expulsions, that would help with individual problems and school problems. We have an epidemic of suspensions in North Carolina and you're right up there with us, as I recall, uh, in California. One out of ten students in North Carolina suspended from school each year. Each year, one out of ten. That's 165,000 kids in our state. Unbelievable. That would help. A chronic truancy initiative, working with those kids that are missing a lot of school. Get them back in school. Uh, Boys and Girls Smart is a good curriculum for individual improvement. After school programs. Don't put them out on the streets after school. Keep those schools open uh, until the parents get home or can come and uh, pick them up. That addresses several uh, areas of needed protection. <coughs> Parent and teacher gang awareness. There's so many myths about gangs. It just drives me crazy. Uh, so so we, we, we need to have a clear understanding about the nature of the gang culture and the fact that once a kid joins a gang, they're not doomed for life. Half of the kids who join a gang outside of L.A. and Chicago, who studies in other cities where the gangs are less intergenerational, half of the kids who join a gang will be out of it within a year. So that's the opportunity for intervention with those that join to try and get them out because half of them will get out. And about half the kids who associate with a gang hang out with them, wear colors sometimes, throw signs sometimes, never join. 
They never join. They just love playing with it. Try, they're trying it on for size. So we shouldn't be throwing the book at them. We need to look at the risk factors. We need to do careful assessment and identify those that are at highest risk. So we need to, we need to be a lot smarter in the way we go about this work. Uh, here are uh, some other interventions that, that uh, work well for uh, kids who are involved in gangs. A family therapy. Let's think about generic programs that are already available in the community. Cognitive behavior therapy, uh, parent training, <coughs> um, family counseling, working with the kid and the parent at the same time, uh, and, and, and the social services, the social work field, uh, uh, child welfare, uh, social work has developed, have made an enormous contribution to the uh, effectiveness of programs. We're talking about the generic features of these programs. CBT, you see, individual counseling, mentoring. So instead of thinking about parachuting a expensive program in, strengthen the programs that you have to make them look more like the programs that are most effective because a lot of these uh, locally developed programs can be very effective. And then there's some structural things you can do. The Santa Cruz County Juvenile Hall Neutral Zone. No gang contracts. Uh, worked. It really helped uh, to reduce the violence. Aggression replacement training. That's a very inexpensive uh, service. That's uh, really uh, CBT mainly. Substance abuse treatment. Mental health treatment. Uh, you need an intervention team to work with these kids who are involved in gangs. They've got lots of problems and, and, and you see with developing that commitment to the gang that you need to help them get out. And, and a lot of gangs, uh, they will be beaten out uh, or uh, perhaps killed in some. So you need to help them get out the same way they got in by gradually disassociating. So that requires an intervention team with services, outreach, an outreach worker, helping that kid manage that process of gradually disassociating and substituting pro-social activities for the negative uh, uh, things that the gang is uh, is doing. Wrong direction. There. Here are some uh, some programs that have been evaluated. the the gang The gang field, uh, as far as far as evaluation goes, is still in its infancy. The federal government, just a few years ago, thanks to Walter Miller's research, <laughs> he surveyed a few cities in the uh, uh, early 1970s. We noticed his research. We expanded it to more cities. And, and, and saw then that there was a serious gun problem across the country. And uh, 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 then uh, the uh, federal government started funding more evaluations, but we only have 14 programs that have demonstrated evidence of effectiveness. Uh, you don't need to take notes on these. You can find them in our strategic planning tool at the National <coughs> Gang Center. They're, uh, they're on site. But I want to highlight the Montreal Preventive Treatment Program because that illustrates the windows of opportunity. This program didn't set out to prevent gang involvement. They set out to reduce delinquency among disruptive boys who were in kindergarten. So they, they worked with them to strengthen their academic skills and they worked with their parents to provide parent training and family strengthening and then at age 15, they looked to see if they had affected gang involvement. And lo and behold, a significant reduction in gang involvement without even trying. Because they disrupted that develop a negative developmental process. They reduced school failure. They you know, improved family adjustment uh, and pro-social peer involvement. They were working with those rejected, alienated kids. And so you will, my point is that from this study is that you can prevent gang involvement by getting all your agencies to work together and target the high-risk families. Agencies, social service agencies, are often <coughs> on the wrong side of town, and you need to move them over. And, and while you're at it, move them up the continuum so they are dealing with higher-risk kids. We now have good risk assessment tools so we can, we can do this. Uh, it, it's a, a systematic process that can easily be implemented. So it means relocating the programs and targeting them on the higher risk kids and those that are likely to, more likely to become gang members. Aggression replacement training, Operation New Hope, a California, uh, California program, working with kids who are coming out of the California Youth Authority, to help them make the transition 
back to the community, <laughs> they reduce gang involvement significantly. This aggressive behavioral control program it was uh, among adult inmates in uh, Canada. Uh, CBT using uh, cognitive behavior therapy with those in a very intensive way that showed large uh, reductions. Uh, Ceasefire Chicago, one of the comprehensive programs, they are using the public health model uh, that I'm describing here of addressing the risk factors, reducing risk, increasing protection, and so on and so forth, to uh, target uh, individuals who are involved in potential shootings. They have trained violence interrupters who go out on the street every day without a gun intervene in potential shootings. That's not a job I'll be applied for. <laughs> uh, of course, and they're successful. Uh, they're all former gang members, so they have a uh, rep, and they're using it in a positive way. So uh, along with some other things they're doing, uh, they've shown a significant reduction. Some of the suppression programs, two of these are uh, here. Uh, uh, all three of those, California program, the LA Hardcore Gang Investigators Unit, very successfully uh, reduced, uh, uh, removed uh, violent members from the street. The Tri-Agency Resource Gang Enforcement Team in Westminster, Integrated Police Prosecution and uh, Probation, uh, very good uh, comprehensive program. Operation Ceasefire Los Angeles, George Tita developed that, evaluated it, showed positive short-term effects. This comprehensive uh, gang prevention, intervention, and suppression model has been found to be effective in five cities now including two in Los Angeles, recently in Boyle Heights, and uh, earlier uh, in uh, another area of, uh, oh, I can't remember the other area. Uh, and also in Chicago, and uh, Richmond, Virginia, and Riverside, California, in several places. So, the, the, the key thing about these, uh, these programs it, 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 it is that they're not simply a therapy. They're not a therapeutic program, but rather it's a structure. We think too simply, we're just looking at program services. We need to provide a structure to engage the entire community in this public health model. Get everyone involved in assessing your gang problem and using that assessment to develop a strategic plan, looking at gaps in your continuum and figuring out where you need additional programs or to refocus the existing programs. Uh, all, this entire process is now online. We put it in our national, uh, in our national gang center uh, website in the in the OJJDP strategic planning tool. Here are the key key publications around that comprehensive gang model, a best practices uh, report, a guide for assessing your gang problem, and then a guide for implementing the comprehensive gang model. And here's the uh, website, www.nationalgangcenter.gov. And there is this best kept secret, the OJJDP strategic planning tool. We implemented the public health model in this tool. We have the risk factors in there. There's not enough research on risk protective factors in the gang area yet to put those online. But the research is accumulating. And then we link those risk factors with research-based programs across this entire continuum and the gang risk factors are highlighted. All those gang risk factors come from longitudinal studies. There have been several, in, mainly uh, in uh, Pittsburgh, Rochester, Denver, uh, and Seattle, and Montreal that have guided that, uh, that research. So, in conclusion, uh, seriousness of gang activity trumps prevalence. By that I mean don't simply pay attention to prevalence in drawing your conclusions. There was not a big drop in the seriousness of gang activity, uh, as shown in the first figure that I showed you, showing the drop down to 2001 and the increase. Uh, but rather, when you look at the largest cities, especially those over 100,000 population, not much has changed. In fact, in some cities, <laughs> homicides have increased. And uh, two examples right here in, uh, in California. So the stability of serious gang problems is the main story. That's the main point I want to leave with you. Gangs don't change much in the very largest cities because they're rooted. They grow in the cracks of those uh, cities and in the cracks of the communities. By that I mean where the core institutions are weak. The family, the school, 
of the community, uh, lack of uh, public safety. Gangs often provide protection for citizens, particularly in high-rise uh, public housing. It's unbelievable how effective they are. Uh, <coughs> despite the recent crime and violence drop, gang violence remains high. Prevention and intervention can, can be effective if you're using effective services, but the main thing is a comprehensive approach. There are no easy solutions, there's no magic, there's no magic bullet. It just takes a systematic process of implementing the public health model. There's lots of science to support it. Now, let's open it for discussion, questions. Yes. I'll, uh, you'll, you'll have access to it. We'll to you. Yes. 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 Professor Lee will distribute it. Yes. Yes. Um, you mentioned risk factor assessment tools. Can yes. you recommend some? Well, the, uh, the best uh, risk assessment tool for the community is uh, uh, school-based. Uh, uh, there, there are several of those, but the, the one that one that's been implemented in several places in California is Communities That Care, uh, Hawkins and Catalano. The second level of risk is at the juvenile court level. Good opportunity there. They're really good <coughs> instruments in a lot of places that uh, assess risk and treatment needs. So that can be used in your continuum building. The community assessment is really hard. I, I, don't, I don't recommend relying strictly on a student survey. You need to do an assessment of uh, the gangs themselves. Who, what, when, where, why, or how. Who, what, when, where. What are they doing? Where are they doing it? Who's involved? What age groups? Is it around certain schools? Is, is that fueling it? Thinking back to your starter gangs and uh, early gang formation and high rates of gang joining, which the student survey may point to, but you're going to need to do a little more uh, work. Uh, and where you involve uh, key stakeholders in the community in that entire process, then you start to take some ownership of your <coughs> assessment, and then you get wider participation in developing a strategic plan and implementing. You mentioned um, myths that, that parents, other people believe about gangs. Do you mind discussing some of those? So okay. Okay. <coughs> uh, there, uh, I can send you an article uh, that I, I wrote on that uh, where I reviewed the research. Uh, that uh, might be helpful. So if you'll see me afterwards, I'll, uh, I'll get that to you. But uh, parents uh, are scared often into thinking that if their kid is involved in a gang, that, that they won't be able to get out and that it's going to pull them in. A another is that uh, we, we expect parents to keep kids from uh, becoming involved. And that's often beyond the power of the parents because that's just one set of risk factors. There's the school problem, the community problem, lots of crime in the neighborhood, and so on. Uh, another, another is is that, uh, uh, that adults, adult gang members, are recruiting kids at the school. That's very rare. It's 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 a, a natural kind of process in most places for kids to group together. And, 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 and most of when you ask kids, why did you join a gang, the major reason they give is protection uh, and then social reasons to be around uh, girls, go to parties, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's not a mysterious process. So many parents think that their kid was lured into a gang by uh, uh, some fellow in a trench coat who jumped out of the car and part of the schoolyard, you know, pulled them in with uh, candy, a uh, piece of candy. Uh, so that's ridiculous. Uh, so um, <coughs> the point is that they need to understand the gang joining and leaving process and how they can play a supportive role. So the major myth is, is that they cannot do anything about it. They can, and, and we can give them help. Yeah, is there any research you can recommend on, um, school, on how effective it is for schools to maintain a sort of gang-free uh, school environment and how that impacts the students of the school themselves. Yeah. Not joining. Yeah. The 
the research is not terribly explicit on that, but what it shows very clearly and from a general standpoint is that the better the school climate, uh, the lower the likelihood of gang problems. And those indicators are uh, low rate of suspension and expulsion, uh, low uh, use of uh, extreme punishments, and uh, not labeling the symbols of gangs as a punishable offense because some kids are just playing with the uh, gang culture. All right, so, so a reasonable, balanced approach, but with an emphasis on pro-social involvement and minimizing uh, risk of uh, victimization, feeling fearful, so a more supportive environment that involves everyone, and increasing protection. Uh, so a good, healthy school climate will uh, really make a big difference. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, you was on point when you talked about Pittsburgh and Chicago, because I work with a lot of individuals out there. Oh, really? As a matter of fact, some of them are coming out here in uh, April uh, as we put on our International Urban Peace and Empowerment yeah. um, Summit. But you said um, here uh, that where the core institutions are, we gang activity prevails. And then you said, but we can't be more preventive if the agencies relocate, uh, relocate where? Right. Where, where the problem is developing. Where the problem is developing. And being willing to work together. A couple of my colleagues wrote a really powerful piece about the failure of agencies in St. Louis to work together. They wouldn't share information with each other on the right, families right. they were working with. Yes, and they defended their own turf. Uh, uh, their budget and so on. They said, that's not our client. No, no, that's, that's somebody else's, you know. So they wrote this article that was titled, I'm Down for My Organization. <laughs> <laughs> and they were acting like gays. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Well, I know about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, but I want, I want to share something with you uh, uh, in terms of what you said, because uh, the last summit that we had in Pittsburgh, because the leadership there did not share with their neighborhood that people were coming from across the nation. We came to ride. Yeah. And nowhere else yeah. have we done the summits where people knew that other people were coming in. Yeah. Have we had any problems? Yeah. Yeah, I read about that. Yeah. That's a mistake. Yes, over there, I think here. Um, have, have you looked at any of the um, sort of larger issues that, uh, that are kind of more the root causes, like uh, yeah. you know, just our U.S. Uh, uh, you know, the United States culture of violence. Uh, right. Have you looked at uh, anything to do with like the Second Amendment? Uh, does anybody trace where these guns are coming from? That, that are just kind of coming into our neighborhood yeah. and, uh, magically and uh, like that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. There, there's there's not a lot of research on the big picture except that, that the early research that was done at the Chicago School. Uh, Frederick Fasher was the first gang researcher, so social disorganization became a very powerful uh, explanation. So, so very clearly that is uh, is related. We've not looked enough at uh, racial and ethnic uh, violence and, and uh, tensions. Uh, a new concept uh, uh, sociologist at uh, TIDA at uh, UC Irvine called this ethnic <coughs> churning. So it's not just a matter of invasion and succession of different racial and ethnic groups, but it's the mixture of those and the clash of, of those that's uh, really that's really important. Uh, we've uh, we've not looked at those uh, uh, larger uh, conditions uh, the way we uh, need to, and we hope to be able to do that by drilling down into these trajectory groups and looking at census data to see what factors might help to explain that, but. But, but the, the point is that communities have histories that contribute to gang involvement. And that's what we need to look at is the entire community. You're right on there. Over here and then back here. Um, I was just going to ask about, you found it helpful for the data to separate into these trajectories. Um, and you kind of touched on you know, interventions playing a part in like leading down the community's history. Yeah. But has, have there been studies that have shown Oh, no, 
No, uh, the, the research is not that sophisticated yet, but what the research does show is that intervention teams are very effective when they have very strong outreach component and involve the key agencies in the community, especially probation, police, juvenile justice, social services, so that they're working intensively with this clearly identified set of kids. They develop a, a objective set of criteria for selection of kids that are definitely actively involved in gangs, but are not yet so violent that law enforcement won't agree to let them work with them. But those younger gang members who are not yet uh, committed uh, to a career of, uh, of violence. So where those agencies work together with intensive services, they've shown <coughs> sharp reductions in, in gang-related crime. And in some cases, uh, removal from the gang, but in generally speaking, a clear diminishing of the seriousness of offenses that they're involved in. So it's that intensive work involving multiple agencies with really strong outreach that shows the best results. Yes, here. Yeah. Can you uh, talk at all about if there are any differences or the similarities between uh, males and females that, that join, join gangs, yes. prevalence, and other kinds of things with intervention? Yes. Yes. Well, the boys are dumb. They're dumb. They won't get out. Like the girls get out early. The boys don't. They're just slow learners. I don't know how else to explain it. I can't sugarcoat it. But the girls get out at a much younger age, and very much smaller percentage of them are career uh, gang uh, members. Now, we've seen an increase in, uh, in female gang involvement. There's no question about that. Whether it is an increase in seriousness remains to be seen. We're still we're looking out at the edge there, probably, you know, it's called you know, the marginal effect. Uh, uh, so we don't know about greater seriousness, but the studies do show that the girls in the gang commit offenses as serious as boys. They just don't commit as many of them. They're not as high rate set of offenders, and they get out earlier. Uh, uh, so we're, we're more successful, though, in, in working with the girls because the boys are so dumb. And they don't get it. They don't, you know, they don't catch on fast enough. It's easier to build protection around girls than it is around boys. And uh, Professor Lee and I were talking about that earlier. She has some good ideas on that. So that, that may be one of the reasons that it's easier to uh, provide protection for them. Yes. Has there been any policy reform effort um, by the National Gang Center within the justice system since it um, more harshly punishes gang-related violence? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the first part. Um, has, has there been any policy reform effort by the National Gang Center yeah. um, within the justice system since it more harshly punishes people with gang-related violence? Yes, yes, yes. There, 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 needs to, there needs to be a, a more balanced approach there uh, based on risk, uh, based on risk and uh, prior offense history. We need to use, uh, the, the main policy change that we promote is using risk assessment instruments, objective instruments. This will diminish the proportion of minorities that are punished more severely because the assumption, the myth, that they're more likely to be involved in gangs when what the self-report studies show is that it's about even, it's about even white kids and minority kids. Another myth is that it's immigrants. Uh-oh, wait a minute. When you look at the immigrant populations, the first uh, immigrant, uh, the uh, first generation, has lower rates of violence when they come to the United States. It's not until the second generation that it starts to increase. Whoa, this point back there. We're creating violence creating violence in our communities, and, and so it's the conflict and so on and such other reasons. But the main thing is to use objective tools to manage risk and in a forward-looking model rather than punishing the offense. Look at the characteristics of the offender and treatment needs. Okay, yes. two, more, two more questions. Two more questions. Okay, here and here. She was first. Um, what is her Coordinating a gang awareness conference workshop. What key points do you think should be emphasized to educators and teachers? Educators. Educators and parents. 
educators and parents. I would uh, I, I would urge uh, that you get a copy of a bulletin at our National uh, Gang Center, A Parent's Guide to Gangs, that's in English and, and uh, uh, Spanish. Um, uh, and the, the main thing is educating them about what gangs are like, using the research, the myths, uh, using uh, data that shows that uh, the history of uh, gang involvement on most kids is not very long, that there's hope that most of them will get out if we do nothing, but uh, <coughs> those who stay are the ones that are seriously victimized because, and that's another important thing to point out, is that those kids who are joining a gang for protection, it's like a mirage. They're more likely to be violently victimized and at the hands of their members of their gang. So that reality needs to be emphasized well. So take it seriously, but don't feel like it's a doom kind of uh, situation. There's hope. They can be pulled out successfully. So work with the authorities and, and social service agencies in uh, providing uh, help. Yes? Um, so my question is in relation to how do you work with gangs that are, like I know you said about immigrants, um, right. those that are already established, like I'm specifically thinking Salvador, yes. El Salvador, when they come over, do you work internationally with the, that country or do you do any type of work? Because yes. that's a little bit more entrenched in that field. Yes, country. yes, you're absolutely right. That's a very good point. Uh, the uh, problem there is probably not intractable. The, uh, the, the, these are, are, are not transnational gangs in the fullest sense. That is, that they're operating in multiple <coughs> countries uh, and, and have uh, their own satellite operations there. That, that's not the case. It's the movement back and forth, specifically MS-13 and 18th right. Street, you know, predominant cases. So they're being refueled uh, at, because of the movement back and forth and the deportation policies, sending them back, taking the American gang culture with them, and then coming back with more of it. I mean, it's like a vicious cycle. We've got to break that cycle. Uh, so that's going to take stronger uh, collaborative efforts of prevention and intervention and lots of suppression, too. So what's missing right now is prevention and intervention. The uh, Washington uh, uh, Office of Latin Americans has a very good model uh, that uh, I would recommend.